It says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall, not, shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth. And the idols shall wait for his law. Amen. In Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse number 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Our Father, thank you for being so good to us, for loving us, and Lord, for allowing us to be in the house of God tonight. Now help us learn of thee, and long after thee, and Lord, love you with all of our heart, and we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I, I thought toward this year's Thank God for Grace meeting is uh, grace to serve. Grace to serve. Last year it was uh, worship. This year it would be grace to serve. And, and uh, when I think about grace to serve, I think about God's divine servant. The beloved servant in whom he is well pleased. And, and I want to look at uh, this thought tonight from here in verse number 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And so I, I find some things that, not, that he is the conqueror, judgment unto victory. He conquers sin and gives us victory so that we are more than conquerors uh, through him. And I want to see just a few things here. Uh, we will not take long, but we want to look at a few things. And I want to see uh, Christ, the servant of Jehovah, the chosen servant. And we want to see the cherished servant, the capable servant. We will look at the conduct of the servant and we'll look at the, uh, we will look at the compassion of the servant. And then we will just end up with the conquering of the servant. And uh, he is a conquering servant. So I want us to look and see that, first of all, he is God's chosen servant. My servant whom I have chosen. His elect. He was elected, chosen by God. Not chosen by God unto salvation, for Christ had no need to be saved, but chosen for God by God unto service. A job that was set up especially for the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me say, that is what election is about. Election is about service. God chooses somebody to do a particular thing. And when God, therefore we talk about man being called to preach uh, or chosen, you know, God has chosen this one to be a call to missions and all that. God, he picks the place, he picks the people, he picks, but he, he only has one purpose, that he might be glorified. God does it. How this is to be done, what you're supposed to do. And so we find that Christ, the servant of Jehovah, was a chosen servant. But not only do I see him as a chosen servant, but I see him as a cherished servant. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Now why was the Father's soul well pleased? Because Christ did always those things that pleased him. Even though he was tempted at all points like as we are, Yet he was without sin. He never sinned. Some would argue, well, he couldn't sin. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to tell you he didn't sin. You know why? That's what the Bible says. That's right. 
He was without sin. He was tempted in all points like as we are. But the, the devil had nothing in him that would cause him to fall after, go after that temptation. But he has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands what we're going through because he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not made sinful flesh. Oh, there was no sin in him. Oh, he had the blood of the Father. Now you and I, we know that we're first but one man sinning in the world and death by sin, and death passed upon all men for the all of sin. But not so with Jesus, because he had a different father. He had a, a heavenly father. Hallelujah. Not an earthly father. Oh, Joseph, they thought was his father, but he was not his father. Now there were those who thought that he was a child of fornication from some other father. Matter of fact, that's when Joseph was wondering what was going on until the angel of the Lord spoke to him. And when the angel of the Lord spoke to him and told him, take, that to, take her to be your wife, take Mary to be your wife, you know what he did? He went and did so. He was going to put her away privily. But we find that this servant was cherished, the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. I mean, he is, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was well pleased with him at the day of his baptism. He was well pleased with him at the cross. I'm talking about he was well pleased with his whole life. And so Jesus could say to me, to, to, or could say to the Father, uh, restore to me the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Because he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. A cherished servant. Let me say something else about him. He was a capable servant. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He had the spirit without measure. God gives us the earnest of the spirit. But can I say, every bit of the Holy Spirit of God was living within Jesus Christ. For him will all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Every bit of God dwelt in Christ. When he was on earth. It was not three different gods. It was one God made of three persons. And every bit of every bit was in all three. Amen. God was manifest in the flesh in the person of the Lord of Jesus Christ. Every bit of God lived in Jesus Christ. Very capable to accomplish everything that God would have accomplished. Let me say this about us. God says he'll fill you with his spirit. He said, lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fill you to accomplish everything that I have a desire for you to do. He does not leave us comfortless, and he does not leave us helpless. God is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He gives more grace than a home. He's a capable servant. Then we see the conduct of the servant. You'll notice a couple of things here. He will not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. The conduct of the servant. Let me say he was not loud or boisterous. He was not out there trying to say, look at me, look what I can do. Watch me serve. And he was not, he did not lash out at folks. He was not looking for a battle. He was not out to strive with people. He lived in confidence, not in arrogance. I think about that, the contrast of this servant. And yet, and, and yet I, and, and in the compliment of this servant. And I consider over there in the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 17. We find a Philistine, Philistinian servant. And then we find a precious servant over there. The one who was a friend of God. Or a man after God's own heart. Excuse me. A man after God's own heart. That precious servant. And we find a Philistinian, Philistinian servant. And there was a, a contrast here I see of Christ and this, and this Goliath. 
Because here's the lie. In chapter 17, he says in verse number 4, we get to 17, verse number 4. Oh. He says, And there went a, out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And a, a staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of, of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood, and this is what he said, and he cried out to the army of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will I we be your servants. And if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that he will fight together. Do you hear his arrogance? Not just confidence, but a, 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 an air of arrogance. Verse number 42, he tells them again, he says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David and disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy of his fair countenance, and the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with stays? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the field. God tell you two things. He was loud. He cried these things out, and he lashed out. He was for the battle. He was a striving man, a man of war from his youth. That is not how Christ is. And let me say, David, that is a sweet example. That's a picture of Christ was not like that. Verse number 17, he tells us he was chosen. Take now thy brethren and eat all parts of corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp up to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses and the cap of their thousand looking thy brethren fair and their pledge. I mean, he's just going out there to just do his, what his father told him to do. Can I say? And then he finds himself in the midst of a battle. In the midst of a battle. He was chosen. He was confident. Verse 34. And David said to Saul, Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord has delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the, this Philistine. Do you hear any arrogance? He said the Lord's doing this. God will do this. There's a confidence, not an arrogance. He was not self-confident, nor did he look at his self-capability. He looked unto the Lord. I want to tell you that the conduct of our servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, was confident, not arrogant. He did not lash out with his mouth to boast or to be brash. Or to go in the battle. He just went to take care of business. Because that's what he was sent for. I see the conduct of the servant. And then I see the compassion of the servant. In verse number 20. In verse number 20 I see the compassion. And this is where I want to spend just a few moments. Instead of Bruce Reed. Shall he not break and smoke it black? Shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory? Three things. He does not quash. He does not quench. And he does not quit. 
until he conquers. He does not wash. Do you see this? As he tells him right there, a bruised reed shall he not break. I mean, oh, think about this. Think about dear uh, Brother David. As Brother David went and fought the battle, and he, he whooped the Philistine. But after he whooped the Philistine, he did not go back and tell them folks, look what I did, and put them down for being worry warts. He said he, can't, he just led them in the battle so they could conquer the Philistines. Do you realize the natural heart, the natural man has a tendency of boasting on ourselves and putting down everybody else who quits? Oh, when the, when the older boats were, safe, were struggling, he told them and uh, they had to stay by the stuff. David came back and gave them the same blessing he gave everybody else. Why? Because they stood, they stuck by the stuff. They were faithful as much as they could be. But they were weak. They were weary. Can I say he does not quash? He does not quench. It may just look like it's a little smoky. Might be a smoldering. But he does not quench because he does not quit. Now I just say this. That is good to me. That helps me. Because there's times I've been battling with some giants. There's times I felt like I, I can't go any farther and I'm about to be busted up. And I cry out to Jesus, dear God, help me. And I find out he does not quash me for not being as faithful as I ought to be. For not living in the confidence I ought to live in. For not living as a more than conqueror through him. He does not wash me. He does not quench it. There's a little flame there somewhere underneath. There's something there. There's a spark there. And he says, hey, it only looks like smoke. But he said, and he blows on that little and he, until it brings forth victory and a flame flames out. Amen. You feel like a bruised reed. You smell like smoking flax. The bruised reed that's about to break the, the smoking flax that's about to burn out. You say, ah, that shouldn't happen. Amen. It shouldn't, but it does. And it's happened before. I think about a man who was desperate in Mark uh, chapter 9. I find a man who was desperate. And he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. That is a man who's got something burning there. But if you look before that, verse number 22, and I'll just I'll read it to you. Uh, verse chapter 9 and verse number 22. He said, And oft times he cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can. He was not speaking of a whole lot of confidence there. He says, I hope you can. I need your help. And he says, Lord, there's something inside of me that's about to break. Lord, there's something inside of me that's about to burn out. I believe you, but I can't help it. I've got some unbelief. Can I say when you're in times of desperation, the Lord is not going to uh, break you down and burn you out, let you burn out. He's going to breathe on you with the Holy Ghost of God. I talk about this one who is in desperate situations. I talk about John chapter 20, that one who was in discouraged situation. Do you remember him? We call him Doubt Thomas. I call him Disbelieving Thomas because he said, I will not believe. But I can tell you what happened. Oh, things happened and the Lord was taken from them and crucified. And the Lord was crucified. Everything he hoped in, everything he looked for, that one he thought was the Christ, the Son of the living God, was now dead and gone. What happened? He was 
supposed to deliver Israel. He's discouraged. But you know what? He didn't even hang out with the brethren. He was so discouraged that he disappeared. And then when they run into him, they say, listen, we saw Jesus last night. Jesus came by last night. I'll not believe unless he lets me put my head, my finger in his hand and my hand in his side. And then they, seven days later, that week later, oh, hallelujah, here he comes on that Sunday night. And here's, here Jesus shows up on the scene. And he says, Thomas, go ahead. Put your finger, behold my hands. Put your fingers in it. Behold my side. Put your, and Thomas did do it. He just looked at him and fell down and said, My Lord and my God, Jesus did not leave him when he was discouraged. He said, I'm not going to let you be broken. And I'm not going to let you burn out. I'm going to breathe on you. I think about dear brother Peter who was disheartened. He denied the Lord three times. And he went out and wept, broken. But when the Lord saw him, he said, Love is thou many more than these. And he brought Peter to the end of himself and just said, Go feed my sheep. Go feed my lamb. Go feed my sheep. Just get up and go and do what you're supposed to do. The Lord fed him and sent him away to do the work that God wanted him to do. He did not because he does not break the bruised reed. He does not burn that smoking flax burn out. He breathes on us with this sweet spirit. Then it was a leper. In Matthew chapter 8, he was doubting whether it was God's will to heal him. He was like, I don't know if I can do it. But he said, if thou will, if thou will. And Jesus said, I will. You know what happened? He said, you got a little bit of faith. It doesn't take but the faith of a mustard seed. All you got to have is a little bit. Just let it linger there. And Jesus says, one day, oh, when you come to the place that you I want to just breathe on it, I'm not going to let it burn out. Smoking flies. It just looks like it's smoldering. But Jesus says, oh, it'll go to where it's just flat to a flame. Say, why? Because he will not quit until he brings forth he said, I go through these things. Charles Haddon Spurgeon went through depression. But Jesus keeps working on his weakness. Struggling faith, or struggling faith still has a smoldering fire, I'll tell you this. The breath of the Spirit will continually softly blow until the flame fires up. And I'm going to tell you what happened. 2019, first week of tent meeting, a man went forward, said, I'm going to surrender to whatever God wants me to do. The next week, God started dealing with him about some things. The man ran from God, from the will of God, for two years. October 3rd of this year, the man said, Really, Lord, you want me to preach, I'll preach. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And he yielded his life to the call of preach. Two years! <clears throat> it was smoking. He was struggling. He was not sure. He wasn't. He didn't say, no, I won't. He just said, God, I'm not, I'm not ready. He ran that call. Then Brother Tick and Chris a text. He said, God called me to preach. And I said, remember to call me on October 3rd. He said, what happened? God kept breathing. The man kept struggling. God 
kept breathing. He says, look, you've got a bit of faith. You're struggling in your faith. I'm not giving up. Don't, don't give, don't give up. Because he's not giving up. He'll not give up on those that are struggling. Those who are having a hard time. Say, preacher. That's what he's saying. Is that not what he said? I might read it again. Just might read it again. The month, verse number 20. A bruised reed shall he not grow. And smoking flax shall he not wince. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. You know what? In his name, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. He says, guess what? He said, I'm going to do a good work in you. I'm going to put a new song in your mouth. People you praising our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. I brought you up out of that horrible pit, out of miry clay. I didn't leave you disheartened. I did not leave you discouraged. I did not leave you doubting. I did not leave you desperate. But I brought you up out of the world. Out of the miry clay. Set your feet upon the rock. Establish your door. Put a new song in your mouth. And it'll go all the way to Gentiles over here and trust you. The world will see your good work. And glorify your father in his head. I just excited when I read that. Because God is not done. He's still. Sometimes I get discouraged. Sometimes I get to doubt. I say, preacher, I know I'm not as spiritual as the rest of you out there. But I do sometimes. Not a mighty rushing wind that'll blow it, blow it out, but just enough of that soft, sweet spirit just to get the flame of God. Oh, thank God. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord.